and when you come with pure understanding, when Krishna comes with his chariot drawn by white horses, when Jesus comes through the sky on his white horse of pure understanding, with fire in his eyes, with a higher level of consciousness, the brain cycle we call Delta. When Muhammad comes, riding the Barak to speak to Allah, to make a decision that his people must overcome their five senses, praying five times a day. Just as Jesus had to be wounded five times on the cross before he became the Christ, he was a man until that point. Until we all see that and we all surrender our five senses and with it the pleasures that dominate us within there, at least once a day, then we will always see this division. And I and other persons who live in areas like I do now, who have been interrupted by a hungry man whilst I'm making this video, no less, will always see the suffering that it divided humanity because they can't agree on the name of God faces. God has many names and many beliefs and systems to reach him. It's cultural. But if we can all accept that many roads can lead to God, because it is coded in every single text, every single scripture, that there is a common way for all humans to reach God, which is overcoming the lower nature, passing through the seven energy centers, and, and communing with God in the higher realms of consciousness. All scriptures say this. And if we all find that, the world can heal. Hey guys, so I'm having a laid back Sunday and that allows me to go a lot deeper into myself than what I can during the week. I'm of course still planning what's going to happen with Feathers Tail and still working out how we can develop things and, and different things we can do uh, to make our voice louder for the children here. But there's also another, I don't like the word message there's also another part of the the song in my heart if you will i think it's the best way to describe it which i see as part of the solution to what i'm trying to tackle here ultimately i'm head on with the suffering that poverty causes and from there as well, I'm head on with the things that, other, that, that, that cause the poverty, such as division, uh, such as inequality. Now, one such division which drives many of us into a state of much despair, shall we say, is that of religion. And when I can go deep within myself with regards to mysticism and esoterics, it shows very clearly for me that within every religion there is a core message that is the same. Now I'm not just speaking of love, I'm not saying there's a core message of love, but the reason I show esoterics is I believe that if people can just take the time to put aside what they already know, to put it to one side and, and say, okay, Others accept what I already know. They accept the literal stories and what I believe. But there's another layer, a language which predates all of the texts that these arguments are over. All of the beliefs that are based on these texts and the arguments that come from them. And that language is an esoteric, mystic language. And if there was some sort of common union in every single spiritual text, and scripture on the planet, then surely we could all start to at least take the first step towards saying, maybe it's okay to accept another's beliefs. So long as we can use those beliefs to reach a position where we seek the love of God and thus the service of God and do the work that God needs. Now, esoteric mysticism repeatedly 
has the ability to do that. Now, of course, many persons can say this religion is bad because this war, this will All religions have caused wars. So it's not a religious or a spiritual problem. It's a human problem. And it, the solution to that human problem is developing the human mind and human body to come to a point where it can reach the love which these prophets and messiahs touched, this love of God, where we can then express it into the world. Now, the problem with many literal, uh, literal teachings is that people don't know how to find that love. They don't know how to find it. They're not sure the process required. And this is all I wish to show. If someone can achieve that love and serve God with the, the love within them by reading the literal story of Jesus or leading, reading the literal story of Muhammad or, or Buddha or, or Krishna, or can do it from reading the literal story of Zoroaster, whichever you're going to follow, then they need not know what I've got to say. You don't need to know about chakra systems because you're already there. It's a process everyone is going through. If you believe uh, that Jesus is the Son of God and you go out in the world and you serve others, then it bears no relevance because you're already at that position. But to why I would look internally with a different vision to you and say, wow, they've, they've managed to reach the higher chakra. They've managed to reach uh, the, the, the higher chakras within their body. That's why they can serve God with love. They have a clean temple to embody the Christ consciousness or the Krishna consciousness, whichever belief system and labeling you give it. So, if we look around, I've shown many times inside of these texts, there is a solution. And in Eastern mysticism, the solution to find that love is described as being able to overcome your seven energy centers, which is basically a way of saying having dominion over your lower nature of your human body. The, the impulsive part of you that will lean towards lust and gluttony and all of these things that we deem as sin in some language, to have a, a physical and practical way to overcome them. Instead of just calling out for someone to forgive you every time you do these things, actually having a process you can go through, a, a physical, scientific way to be able to overcome those things. And this is the common union that I can see in every single scripture. Every has this in them, all of them, but they use mysticism to describe it. So. I've spoken in length before about how in Christianity you will always find people lost in the wilderness, wandering in the wilderness, lost. They don't know where to go and then they find seven of something or they wander for seven years or they find seven sisters as Moses did. Or even the brothers Grimm, they, they, they knew, they knew about mysticism. That's why Snow White wanders in the forest by herself until she finds the seven dwarfs and she is tempted by vanity. She's tempted by the law of nature until she finds dominion. Now, it's just the same story repeated in a non-scriptural non and biblical way. But inside, let's take a look at the story I want to look at the day in the Quran is the seven heavens in the Holy Quran. And in the Holy Quran, uh, Muhammad, he takes uh, transport upon the Barak, now forgive if the pronunciation is wrong, I haven't grown up in the Middle East and also forgive that I always lean towards Christian esoterics and mysticism, which I should stop doing because the whole point of me speaking about it is this common union that we can all self-develop using the instructions from it. But the, the Barak is described as like smaller than a mule, so it leans towards the idea it's like a white horse-like creature. Now. The white horse is common in all scriptures and the white horse in scripture, I'm not pulling it from thin air, it's a mystic language which predates the scriptures itself. It is a symbology, a language of symbology is being used and lost and that's the problem we face. Now white means pure and horse means understanding. So Muhammad, uh, upon the Barak, he takes his journey 
through the seven heavens, and at each heaven he meets the prophets, the prophets of Islam, as it is said. And when he meets the prophets, they, they each bless him, and he is with Jabril, who is ultimately Gabriel. And as he travels through the seven heavens, the seven heavens in mysticism, esoterics, are the seven energy centers of the human body. In Christianity, and there at the right hand of him is a book sealed up the back with seven seals. The, the seven sisters of Moses, after he wanders in the wilderness, he finds union with his seven energy centers. In the Surah 18, in the Quran, there are seven people who go into the cave. And when they go into their cave, they leave the dog at the entrance. They leave in the Middle East. The dog represents the law of nature, just as in the Bible. Uh, a lion represents the law of nature with Samson. The dog is left at the door to stretch his legs because it is a part of you that must come with you. As Carl Jung said, you must integrate the lower with the higher. Uh, as in Tao, you have the yin and yang. You, you must integrate the two to be complete. You must accept that it's part of your being. The lower nature will always exist in a human because we are ultimately an animal uh, and a being at the same time. But the animal nature will always be within you somewhere and can always be triggered by the negative aspects of ourselves. So the seven go within the cave to go with internally within themselves and they leave the animal nature at the door. The Ark of Noah must brave the storms of life for seven months before it comes to rest on a mountain, the higher place, which is the higher levels of consciousness in meditation. Once it, you have found dominion over these seven energy centers. So he travels through the seven chakras until he, he reaches a point where he speaks with Allah. And when he speaks with Allah, uh, whilst traveling with his barak, this white horse, traveling with pure understanding through his seven energy centers and speaking to the prophets who hold a message for each of the energy centers or heavens uh, th that he conquers, then he reaches Allah and he has a discussion with Allah and Allah asks that he prays for far too many times, an unachievable amount of times for his people. So he goes down and Moses is actually at the next chakra down and Moses says, go back to Allah. You can't possibly ask your people to pray that many times. Allah is asking too much of you. And this exchange goes on. And then eventually uh, Muhammad comes to an agreement that they will pray five times a day. Now what this whole exchange is doing in mysticism, it's telling you, you have found with pure understanding on the white horse, the Barak in this instance, a, a, a beast like a horse. You found your pure understanding. You've gone through your seven energy centers and with God, you have come to a point of making a decision that you will find union within your five senses, your five energies, your, your five senses, your animal nature. How are you? And I'm fine. How are you? Hold on, guys. One second. Sorry guys, a local actually just came to tell me that he was a little bit hungry and needed something to eat, so I told him to come round. This is East Africa, this is what it's like. So, Muhammad comes to a decision, an agreement I should say, with Allah. And this agreement he comes to with Allah is that they will pray five times. Just as I come to an agreement with God that I will daily do my best to sacrifice my five senses to commune with God, I will surrender the pleasures of my five every single day. I will surrender them so as I can turn myself over and seek the kingdom that is within, the kingdom of God is within. So Muhammad spoke with Allah and they made it a, an agreement that the people would pray five times a day. Mystic mystically speaking with numerology, which is a big part of all these texts, he has just agreed that they will f surrender their five senses in prayer. They will do that whilst communing uh, with themselves in, in meditation and overcoming in prayer the seven heavens or the seven energy centers or the chakras as they are deemed in Eastern mysticism, 
or the seven seals as they are called in Christianity. All of this is done whilst riding the Barak, whilst riding upon pure understanding. Now, as I say, this is a language that is documented. It's not arguable that this is not a message contained within the story. Mysticism and esoterics is a documented language that predates the scriptures. It's not a question of me coming up with ideas. It's a question of me using a language to interpret the texts. Now, you may take them as literal, but you should also understand that the mystic language is there, so you must learn it. Or you're going to miss a huge part of the scripture. Now, coming with pure understanding is not an aloof idea that just comes from one scripture. If you move over to uh, the Hindu faith and Hinduism, then the white horse is belonging to, first of all, Krishna, comes into battle and comes between Arjuna and the battle on a chariot drawn by white horses. Most of the time in Hindu faith it is depicted with four or five. Now they say the five white horses represents again the five senses and the overcoming of it. The four will represent the fourfold nature or the, the, the overcoming of the four common emotional states of a human being. There's a little bit of a gray area in, in Hinduism regarding that, but it's often depicted with four or five. But either way, Krishna comes with pure understanding. And in doing that, Arjuna falls to his knees and says, I, I, I can't fight this battle anymore. Because because of the pure understanding of the Krishna consciousness, the battle represents the pursuit of the, of the material wants and needs. And the material wants and needs are surrendered by the Krishna consciousness, the Christ consciousness, or by communing with Allah. And he says, I don't want this battle anymore. It doesn't make sense to me to pursue those things. And because of the pure understanding, the white horse, Arjuna ceases to want to do battle. He, he loses hope in it. He doesn't understand why he's there. Also, the, one of the avatars of Vishnu, Kalki, Kalki is the tenth, the tenth avatar, I think, of Vishnu, rides on a white horse and is the end of unrighteous living ultimately. When the pure understanding comes, so the unrighteous living shall end. And this is how it is meant to be. Now, in Christianity, Jesus comes on a white horse. Now, there's a similarity between Kalki and Jesus in as there is fire present. Jesus comes in Revelation, Revelations, or Revelation 19. He comes riding a white horse. Now, to take this literal, you cannot believe, I, I feel, it doesn't make any sense that Jesus will come in a literal sense galloping through the clouds on a white horse and do battle with the, the principalities of evil. Because if he comes in his physical form as he did before, what's a man on a white horse? What's any of these crusaders on a white horse going to do against modern day evil and weaponry? Nothing, because it's not a literal thing. The true battle will be internal. Because those who hold the weapons of hate and evil and the, the negative, uh, destructive war machines can be changed from, from within by the galloping white horse with Jesus upon it of pure understanding. So Jesus comes with pure understanding with fire in his eyes. Earth, water, air, fire, new mind. The four stages of consciousness, beta, alpha, theta, delta, the four stages of your brain in meditation and in your waking life, in sleep. And with that, the baptism of fire, Jesus will come with fire in his eyes. He will come through the air on a horse <clears throat> to bring to you pure understanding where you will reach the level of Greek mysticism, which is fire, the, the level in your mind 
where you reach the point where your mind is silent enough to be baptized by fire. Kalki comes with the flaming sword, he is no different. Kalki comes on the white horse with pure understanding <clears throat> and with the pure understanding comes your ability to raise up to the level of consciousness that we call fire or in modern day science, the brain cycles beta, alpha, theta, delta. You reach delta. Now, because of understanding mysticism, I can see something very important. All of the religions are telling you to do the same thing in different ways. Except we've gotten to a point now where some religions are claiming they are the only way. For instance, Christianity will claim it is the only way to God. Yet I see many ungodly Christians. They do not serve, they do not fast, they do not follow what Christ told them to follow. But they call themselves Christian. They call dark light and light dark. And it's not working in my eyes because you have men and women all over the world who are dwelling in a sinful way of life, getting drunk every weekend, partying, adultery. And they go to church on a Sunday and they are told this, that and the other. Or they go to the mosque and they pray. Or even they meditate. For all, Buddhism is not so much a religion. Or they go to the Hindu temple and they leave and they are not disciplined. Because when the religion is not brought to you with the science of overcoming the internal workings of yourself, then where are your practical tools to stop behaving in that way? As Carl Jung said, where are your practical tools to integrate and dominate your shadow? Where are they? If a human being goes into a room and says, forgive me, they've made a good start. At least they can start inside themselves, forgiving themselves and, and forgiving the wrongs they've done and start to heal from that and, and ask forgiveness from God as well. But tomorrow, when the impulse comes to commit the sin they're asking forgiveness from happens, how do they overcome that with nothing but reading words from a book and stories of ancient persons walking around in a desert? The practical tools disappear because the language of mysticism is ignored and overstepped and just not taken notice of for all it is a language that exists for longer than the scriptures themselves and is involved in the production and the creation of the scriptures. Now, if you involve that language, something else happens. Another layer happens where instead of having pastors who were sexually immoral, which you have here quite often, instead of having godly people who are tempted away because they just think, wow, I'm just a hopeless sinner. I can't stop doing this. You have men of God who can see the right path to take. They understand the right path for those who are not managing. Some might manage, some might be disciplined, but many are not. I know I was once one. And they see the path of righteousness. They see the true path to reach God, but they don't understand the processes on how, because they are not taught from a young age, how to overcome, how to have dominion over your impulses. If you involve mysticism, you find that dominion. It tells you. You must come to a higher place in your consciousness through meditation, through discipline, through fasting. You must find, must find a union with your seven energy centers of your body, which are called chakras or seals in Christianity or heavens in, in uh, the Muslim faith or across everything. The Dharmas, Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism also has the white horse of pure understanding as well. And Zoroastrianism create a Judeo-Christianism, a Judeo-Christianity. So it should be taken note of. But on a, off on a tangent, you must find a union with your seven energy centers. You say, well, how is that? You must raise your energy in meditation. So as you can activate this thing in, in Eastern mysticism, they call the third eye, which in modern day science is called the pineal gland, which in Jacob it said, I have seen God face to face and I call that place pineal. And Jesus said, let thine eye be single and your whole body will fill with your light. For when you close your eyes and you go into the darkness of meditation, that is where you find the light of God. When you look out at a preacher preaching hate to you 
and telling you that other religions are wrong and should be feared and are demonic, you are seeing dark. And they will call light dark and dark light. They will call evil good and good evil. Bitter sweet and sweet bitter. And these are the times we live in. For people do not find a way to let the Christ come through them because the enemy has poisoned them with our modern day culture so heavily and God is struggling to get the message to you on how to remove that poison from your mind. And I tell you without any failings, if you practice what the Bible, the Quran, the Dharma, the Bhagavad Gita, if you practice even in Sikhism as well, Kali is mentioned in here as well in Sikhism. If you practice these things, if you practice the dominion over your lower nature, you will remove the pollution that the enemy has placed in you in modern day society. And you will find yourself smack dab in the middle of yourself and thus buried in the chest of God and the righteousness that all persons of God should seek. For the only reason I see for our sojourn on this earth is to seek and to know and to serve God. And in doing so, serving others. Some of us are blessed enough to be able to seek, as I have been, to be able to educate ourselves. But there are children I know here, very bright children who could do exactly as I have and never will, because they were never taught to read. They were always busy looking for food or laboring. And so long as many Muslims, Christians, Buddhists and Hindus and Sikhs are broken because they are dominated by their lower nature, many millions, if not billions of men, women and children will never ever be able to seek within themselves the betterment or the knowledge that can allow them to find a, a very pure union with God. They, they might find a union anywhere. For instance, here many persons are close with God because they have nothing to take them away from it. But those of us in the West are so separated from God, billions of us, because the enemy has control of your system, because you are being filled daily with artificial light, which God is not controlling. We are builders. We humans, we can build with many materials. And one of the new materials we can build with is light using, electronic, uh, using electronics and technology. I have built a, a physical community using light by using websites and using videos to get people to share with those in need here. And you can be a builder of that sort too, but not if you're always dancing in the light that's flickered to you by the enemy. And that light poisons you and leaves you troubled and leaves you broken and leaves you uncentered and leaves you unable to commune with God. And when you come with pure understanding, when Krishna comes with his chariot drawn by white horses, when Jesus comes through the sky on his white horse of pure understanding, with fire in his eyes, with a higher level of consciousness, the brain cycle we call Delta. When Muhammad comes riding the Barak to speak to Allah, to make a decision that his people must overcome their five senses, praying five times a day. Just as Jesus had to be wounded five times on the cross before he became the Christ, he was a man until that point. Until we all see that and we all surrender our five senses and with it the pleasures that dominate us within there, at least once a day, then we will always see this division. And I and other persons who live in areas like I do now, who have been interrupted by a hungry man whilst I'm making this video, no less will always see the suffering that it divided humanity because they can't agree on the name of God faces. God has many names and many beliefs and systems to reach him. It's cultural. But if we can all accept 
that many roads can lead to God. Because it is coded in every single text, every single scripture, that there is a common way for all humans to reach God, which is overcoming the law of nature, passing through the seven energy centers, and, and communing with God in the higher realms of consciousness. All scriptures say this. And if we all find that, the world can heal. And the enemy is doing his utmost to make sure that none of you see it. But I can see it. As Jesus said, get thee behind me.